by might, ni par puissance, not by strength, ni par force, but by the Spirit of the Lord, says God. Mais par mon esprit, a dit le Seigneur. He said once more in a little while. Il a dit encore un peu. Before I come back, avant que je revienne, I will shake the heavens. Je vais secouer le ciel. I will shake the earth. Je vais secouer la terre. I will shake the sea. Je vais secouer la mer. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken. God is not just the God of Europe. Dieu n'est pas juste le Dieu d'Europe. God is not just the God of South America. Dieu n'est pas juste le Dieu de l'Amérique du Sud. God is the God of North America. Dieu est le Dieu de l'Amérique du Nord. And we're going to see in Canada Et the greatest voir. move of God we've ever seen. Choosing life tonight. Je choisis la vie ce soir. I'm choosing blessing tonight. Je choisis la bénédiction ce soir. Fill me with your spirit tonight. Remplis-moi de ton esprit ce soir. Welcome to the broadcast today. We're so glad you're joining us here on this, uh, well, in Montreal, Quebec, it's a beautiful day. I don't know what it is where you're at, but this June the, what are we today? June the 18th, 2020. Uh, hey, Shelly from El Paso, Texas. Wonderful. Miriam McGorian. We have Frankie Fango on. Frankie Fango. I love that name. That's a great name. Destiny Elkins. Ready to receive. I love that. Great attitude. Ready to receive. Well, I'm glad you're ready to receive because today we're going to have a powerful broadcast on the fire of God. And I've asked my um, a good friend of mine to come and join me, Pastor Francis Armstrong, which I'm going to introduce to you in a, a bit. And um, he's a wonderful man of God who, you know, the reason why I'm, I, I'm so attracted to his ministry, his life is because uh, he's been in the ministry. We're just talking 35 years and the fire of God, it's not like it weaned out or it, you know, it's less than what it used to be. No, he's, he's like burning at his brightest now, 35 years later. And I wanted to have him on just to, you know, tell you what, what he's done. Because, you know, that doesn't just happen by chance. It's not wishing and luck. There's things he's done, you know, on a daily basis that's done that. And so he's going to come on in just a few minutes. Hey, Karen, on YouTube. Also, if you haven't shared the broadcast, please share the broadcast. Uh, many people ask me, how can I share the gospel? How do I, you know, how can I be used by God in a time where we basically like, well, now we're starting to reopen things, but basically, you know, you can have, it's very limited human interaction right now. Well, one of the ways you can do that is by sharing the broadcast. Let the word go out uh, and uh, you, you'll bless your timeline, your feed, your news feed. People, you, you'd be surprised at how many people have come back and said, man, I just share the broadcast. And, the, you know, that's how we've seen people saved. We've seen people healed just from someone sharing the broadcast. So share the broadcast. It's, a, it's the equivalent of you casting a net in 2020. You're casting a net. And uh, I believe God's going to use this broadcast today to help the many. Before I move on, I just want to read one thing. And then I'm going to introduce our guest uh, from the book of Psalms. Psalms 78. Hey, from Humboldt, Saskatchewan. That's awesome. Melanie, Josh Taylor from Tennessee. We have Karen Bedell from Wildwood, Alberta. Psalm 78 and verse... Sorry, 71. Psalm 71 and verse... Uh, let's go verse 16. The Bible says, I will go in the strength of the Lord God... I will make mention of your righteousness of yours only. Hey, Lamont, logged in and ready. I love that. From Oregon, 10 a.m. now in Oregon. Wonderful. I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of your righteousness of yours only. 
O oh God, you have taught me from my youth, and to this day I declare your wondrous works. Now also, when I am gray-headed and old of age, do not forsake me until I declare your strength to this generation and your power to everyone who is to come. It takes the fire of God to pray a prayer like that. David is saying, Lord, even when I'm gray-headed and old of age, don't forsake me. Even when I'm old, that, that, you know what that tells you? There's no age limit to being used by God. There are people like Lester Sumrall, Kenneth Hagin, all these mighty men of God that didn't like wean down as they grew older. You know, that's the thing with a Christian, a man of God, a woman of God. The older you get, you're like a fine wine. The older it gets, the more useful, the more tasty, the better you are to the world, the better use you are to the world. That's what the fire of God does. The more you expose yourself to the fire of God, the more you're able to be used by God and the more relevant and the more useful and the more of a solution provider you become to your generation. Every single one of you have been called by God to be a solution provider to your generation. The Bible says, I sought for a man who would rebuild the gap. God is looking for a person. He's looking for an individual. He's looking for somebody. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro, seeking one whose heart is loyal to his purpose. One, it doesn't mean you have to be have everything together. You don't have to have the expertise. You don't have to have the skill set. God, you know, there's that saying, God doesn't call the equipped. God equips the called. It doesn't matter how equipped you feel right now. It doesn't matter how useful you feel feel in your heart. David was a shepherd's boy that his own brothers, when he went out to war, when he wanted to, um, he was on the battleground and Goliath was mouthing off. His own brothers came, hey, you're just a runt. Go back to the few sheep that our father has given you to take care of. Why, why are you out here in the heat of the day? Why are you out here in the heat of the battle? He was totally discredited, disregarded by his own family. But God looketh not as man looketh. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart and the grace of God has drawn you to this broadcast today because he doesn't want you to be an ordinary Christian one prayer that you have to pray regularly God I don't want to be an ordinary Christian Lord I don't want to be a regular Christian I don't want to be a Christian who warms up the pew and that's all he does Sunday morning that's my I check in 9 a.m. I check out 11 a.m. and that's my part to play I'm almost doing God a service by going to church that's not the Christian I want to be and the reason God brought you to this broadcast is because God doesn't want you to be like that either. He wants you to be a devil slain, sick, sickness healing, you know, power packing Christian. Jesus said, I have anointed you to what? Not just bear the attack of, dev of the devil, just blend in with our generation. No, I've anointed you to occupy until I come. I've anointed you to cast out devils. I've anointed you to heal the sick. I've anointed you to cleanse the lepers. I've anointed you to raise the dead. And God's going to use you to do that in your generation. And the Bible says, when you receive power, the fire of God, that's what enables you to do it. After you receive power, God enables you to be an effective witness on the earth. You will step into that calling today in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Whether the devil likes it or not, he's last. he has lost the battle over your life. I want you to write that in the comment section before we move on to our guest. The devil has lost the battle over my life. Write that in the comment section. The devil has lost the battle over my life. The devil has lost the battle over my life. I'm free and I'm anointed to set others free. I'm going to introduce our guest right now. His name is Pastor Francis Armstrong, a uh, pastor out of Kingston, Ontario. He's been in the ministry for 35 years. He's been saved for 37 years. God has used him amazingly on the earth, carries the fire of God, uh, unlike, uh, just like a, a very unique individual. And, uh, he's been used by, I mean, he's going to tell you a bit about his story. He's, he's not seen people have people raised from the dead. He has been used by God to raise others from the dead. He's preached all around the world, South Africa, uh, South America, you know, all, all across the world. And uh, God has used him tremendously. And so I'm going to bring him on right now. He's going to introduce himself.
and uh, he's going to take it away. We have like a series of questions. It keeps cutting out. Does anyone else have that problem where it keeps cutting out? Please let me know uh, and we'll fix it. So I'm going to bring him in right now. Pastor Fr Hey, TJ, how you doing? <laughs> Good, you could have kept on preaching. I was enjoying that. <laughs> it's awesome. Sure. I, you know, TJ, I've uh, been ministering now 35 years. I've been a senior pastor. I, I've planted, uh, or, or in ministry, to, uh, planted two churches, uh, one in Alberta that's still functioning today, Frontline Worship Center in, uh, in, Al in uh, Sylvan Lake, Alberta. And uh, I was a youth pastor for a few years as well. And I've been here in Kingston now uh, for about uh, close, I think, 25 years and uh, started the, the church from scratch and, uh, and uh, have worked hard to get it to where it's at now. And uh, it's been a tremendous uh, joy to just see what God's done, because the, the whole powerful thing to me is uh, I know who I am and I know, you know what I'm capable of. And so, uh, so when God put his super upon my natural, something, something took place. And there's no way that I would have the ability or capability. I don't have the education. I don't have the smarts. I don't have, the, 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 I don't have any of that stuff. So I know that this was the, the hand of God and uh, so that God brought us to where we're at today. And uh, so we're thankful for him. And, and how he's done that. So, yeah, so I'm just excited. Uh, I've been pumped all day as I've been thinking about the broadcast and just coming on and uh, sharing with people what God's done in my life. And, uh, and so, um, so you just let me know which direction you want me to go and, and, I'll, and I'll take off there. Sure. Sorry about that. You couldn't hear me. We're going to get into the questions right now. And um, the first question that I have for you, now that I've organized these questions because I, you know, first of all, I did this broadcast because I wanted to hear uh, what Pastor Francis, what he's done in his own life to, to, you know, stir up the fire of God, to guarantee that as he grows up. Because, you know, you hear stories all the time. You know, ministers burning out in the ministry. They have to take these like nine month sabbaticals and they just totally disengage. And, you know, they were fiery when they were young. But then as they grew older, they say, well, you know, I, I, I don't necessarily uh, preach the way I used to preach. I've matured. You know, I used to think I have to <laughs> yell and be excited and jump around. And, you know, they use all these excuses to like pretty much explain why there's no more fire. But Pastor Francis is not like that. Totally, totally different breed. And that's the type of people I like to surround myself with. And so I've organized these questions in a way that, you know, I wanted to just, I would have just called him and FaceTimed him and just asked these questions myself. But I wanted to get you in on it as well because I really believe it's going to greatly benefit you and um, it's going to help you a lot. So my first question for you, Pastor Francis, and when I do this, I'm going to give you the screen and you go ahead, okay. take as long as you want. Uh, people are hungry to hear what you have to say. So the first question is, what have you done to steer up and grow the fire of God in your life. You go ahead and... Okay, so let me go back. Let me go backwards and tell you about a little bit about my testimony because this July, I'll be married 41 years. And so uh, I was 18 years old when I got married. So I want to go back a little bit to give you perspective. And so I didn't know anything about God. I was raised in a sort of a nominal uh, Catholic home. Went to a Catholic you know, school, but didn't really practice uh, any kind of religion whatsoever. My parents were not religious people. Uh, made us go to church maybe a little bit when we were children because of our going to the Catholic. So, so I was raised up in a home where that just wasn't uh, a part of our lifestyle. But alcohol was a part of our lifestyle. My dad was, a, was an alcoholic uh, and uh, at times very abusive and controlling and all of those things. And I was number 11 of 12 kids. So we had a very large family. And so uh, all of us left home at, at a young age. So I got married when I was 18 years old. And uh, my wife and I moved from Ontario to... Uh, to um, uh, out, out west to Alberta, and we start and we started our life together. Uh, what happened three months after, and, and plus we had one child and one on the way before we got married. So here's these two kids, uh, 19 years old. You know, we'd been together, and now we have two kids, but um, you know, and and really no direction for life, just working. And uh, my wife's sister, about three months after we got married, 
uh, got killed in a car accident from a drunk driver in Winnipeg. And uh, so we had ended up three months after, you know, we were married, she was pregnant. We go back to uh, Manitoba to this funeral. And my wife's looking in the casket of her sister, her closest sister to her. And she realizes something, something's in her brain. She goes, my sister's not there. So that encounter started her on a three year journey or so to find the Lord. Uh, her brother, her brother was serving the Lord at that time. And uh, behind the scenes from me, not unknown to me, they were witnessing to her and sharing the gospel with her. And to make, I'm just skipping a lot of the story, but by now we're living in Fernie, B.C. Uh, and I'm working at, at a store and we're doing our thing. We're partying on the weekend. We're, you know, we came out of a life of drugs. We were doing, we were boozing every weekend. Uh, you know, we got a babysitter for the kids. We're out partying. And then one day my wife stopped doing all of that. And she started going to a Pentecostal church just down the street from where we lived. Well, that just set me off. I couldn't believe that she had, you know, gone religious to me. So uh, I took, I think, three months of complaining to a guy that I worked with about this fanatical wife of mine that had given her, you know, life to whoever. And I thought we were going to get a divorce. I didn't think we'd still be together because it's not what I wanted. And he didn't ever shove the gospel down my my, my throat. He, he just shared with me slowly and surely the truth of the gospel until one day, three months later, I had this moment where I knew that if I died, I was going to go to hell. It hit me. No one told me I was going to go to hell. It hit me. I was going to go to hell. And that day, it was April 12th, 1982, uh, at about you know eight something in the morning, I committed my life to Christ. Well, little did I know, I had no idea. Now remember, I have no church protocol. I have no church understanding. The senior pastor of that church came and met me that morning after I got home. I worked night shift. I shared with you know, what happened in my life. I went to my very first Bible study on Wednesday. Uh, I, I tithed, I got my, I tithed for the very first time that Sunday. And I have never missed going to church at least three times a week since then. And uh, so my, my journey with God started. But the, the one thing that stands out to me from the, from the day I got saved, uh, I, I knew that there was something more that I wanted to serve. I wanted to do whatever I could, something inside of me. I, I did, hadn't received the baptism in the Holy Spirit yet. That happened about a month later at a full gospel businessman. Uh, and, you know, I'm one of these guys. I was, I was an athlete. I, I played at a, at a, at a level where I could have went uh, semi-pro. I got offers to play in the States. So that's the sort of the direction I was heading when I got saved. So I go to a full gospel businessman's and I'm, I sort of wait till everybody else kind of went up there and I went up there and he said, do you want to receive the baptism? And I said, I said, yeah, I would. And the next thing I know, I am down on the floor. I mean, I didn't even know I was down on the floor until I woke up and, and I realized, and I could not move my body. The, the, there was a weighty presence on my body where I, I felt I could not move. And I, I didn't know anything about the kabod of God or the weighty presence of God. Uh, I, and I didn't know anything about, to be honest with you, I was Catholic. I knew about Protestants. I didn't know about Pentecostals or Baptists or Methodists or I didn't know any of that stuff. And I still don't care about that stuff. I want, I want God and I want his word. And so, um, so when I came out of that experience and I was, of course, speaking in tongues uh, and baptized in the Holy Spirit, I mean, everything in my life began to change. Uh, and, and little did I know that it, just a, a few short you know, years later, I'd be in full time ministry. So what happened to me, TJ, is I, ha I began to have this insatiable appetite for prayer. And uh, I could not wait uh, to get into the presence of God. And I'm skipping a lot of the story, but my wife and I ended up moving to Logan Lake, British Columbia. And uh, so uh, uh, later, but on the way, before we moved there, here, here's what we did. Here's how raw we were. we were. We were going on holidays, and I knew enough of the Bible to know that we weren't supposed to do anything unless the Lord allowed it. And so Edith, my wife's family lived there, but they, they weren't Christians. And so um, we, we ended up praying together and say, Lord, you know, where do you want us to go on holidays? Now, now, where do you see people today asking God, where do you want me to go on holidays? And because uh, we had given our life to him, we knew that our life no longer was our own. And so we said, OK, God, we don't want to go for selfish pleasure. Where do you want us to go? And we knew that our life was an assignment now. And so he had an assignment for us. So he sent us to uh, Logan Lake to, to her brother's place. And I'm just being honest with you. Every second word was the F word. I mean, he was a guy that didn't matter if kids were there or women were there. He, he just was a, always cursing. And uh, so we went there, but the whole way there, we were both filled with the Holy Spirit. It was an eight-hour drive. We were praying in the Holy Ghost. We were like, shaka, rabosa, tarando. We're driving. Man, we're pumped. We're going there because we're going to share the gospel. And we sort of made this deal that we were going to we were gonna kind of ease our way into this uh, you know, conversation. And uh, I'm trying to hurry here because I think this is important for, for, to start this broadcast off. So we get there, and the first question he says to me, are you one of those born-again Christians now? And, uh, and I said, yeah, I am. He said, do you speak in tongues? 
And uh, I went, yeah. And I'm still kind of like, you know, what in the world going on here? I just got in the door. I didn't even have my bags in. And he said, well, pray in tongues right now. And I said, well, no, I don't want, can we not like wait a few minutes here? Because I'm still new to all this. So he scoots all the kids off the bed. And uh, remember, this guy's Joe Heathen. He's like Mr. Cursor. He's not interested in, you know, anything. And I'm like, what in the world? So he wants to pray. So we sit down in a circle in his living room with these two people who, who don't know Christ. And he wants to hear me praying in tongues. So I, we start praying in tongues, my wife and I. And then he nudges me and he says to me, uh, TJ, he says to me, uh, I want you to pray in tongues. And I said, I am praying in tongues. And so we're praying in tongues again. And he nudges me again. And he says, I want you to pray in tongues. And I said, dude, I am praying in tongues. And so I, we kept praying. And all of a sudden, I saw these whirlwinds. And, and I remember, I'm a new Christian. I don't know what these things are. I start seeing these whirlwinds. I had no idea that the Bible said God speaks out of the whirlwind. And I feel that's for somebody. Whew, I felt that on there. I feel that's for somebody even watching right now. So I began to see these whirlwinds. And all of a sudden, my brother-in-law starts going, whoa, 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 whoa. And, uh, and I'm going, what happened? He goes, man, I'm seeing these whirlwinds in front of me. And I'm going, what do you mean? I'm seeing whirlwinds in front of me. And uh, so the whole time I was speaking in tongues, the reason he kept saying to me, uh, hey, hey, I asked you to speak in tongues is because he was hearing God speak to him in English. And uh, God was talking to this heathen man in English. And at the same time I saw the, the whirlwinds, he saw the whirlwinds. And then he looked at me and he said, whatever you got, I want it. And I prayed for him. No catcher, no nothing. I didn't know anything about this stuff. I wasn't in ministry. And so I used the Bible like a manual, TJ. I used it like I just took it, said, this is what the Bible says. I pointed to it and I prayed with them. Whoo, I feel the Holy Ghost on this. I prayed with them. And all of a sudden, this 220-pound man in his own living room, down he goes, bang, I mean, just slams on the living room floor. And I'm like, oh, he stink. God killed this guy. What happened? For, for using the F word, God killed him. I had no idea what was going on. And all of a sudden, he starts speaking in tongues. I mean, he spoke in tongues for so long that he couldn't speak in English for almost a half an hour. Not a word of English could come out of him. Glorious. I'd never been to Bible school. I'd never been taught the three steps, the four poems, the, the right jump, how to you know, get people to speak in tongues. I just did this, is what the Bible says. I laid hands on him and down he goes. His wife came out as she was in the bathroom. She came out and she goes, I want what he has. So we led them to the Lord. They not, not only them, but their three kids all got saved, filled with the Holy Ghost. And my kids were, were filled with the Holy Ghost at five and seven. And my five-year-old, from the day they got filled with the Holy Ghost, TJ, we were in the living room of my home and a wind blew in on an August where I thought somebody opened the doors. The wind of the Holy Spirit blew into our living room and my five-year-old, with tears coming down his cheeks, says, Dad, I want to witness to people. He could, that was his first thing that he wanted to do. I want to witness to people. And it was just on him and to such a degree. So we were birthed in this. I didn't need a PAOC church or a Pentecostal church or a, or a whatever church. We had Jesus in our lives. And the baptism and the Holy Spirit came into our lives. And, and then so we were in prayer one night. We used to pray. So this people may or may not even believe this. I read the entire Bible, TJ, in two weeks, cover to cover. As God is my witness, I, I, I put everything else out of my life. As a matter of fact, we cleaned our house out. Every single thing that was we deemed was secular left our home. Everything. We cleansed it out. Every book, every, every show, every movie. We, we put our television away, and we never even touched it for three years. We immersed ourselves in God's Word. We immersed ourselves in Bible studies like we were in a Bible school before we knew what Bible school was. And we were just in this thing, in, in, in. And so were our children. And so in this process of time, I had two visions uh, very clear to me. The, the one was I saw, I, and, and again, I had never read the book of Revelation at this point because people said, you know, wait till you're a little more mature. And then I read it and said, you're blessed to be read this book. And I said, why would some dummy tell me not to read this thing? But I had never read it up to this point. And I saw a vision of Jesus standing at my right side. He looked huge. And I was kneeling down. He put his right hand on my right shoulder. No words were exchanged. And when I shared with a friend of mine what I had seen, he turned to me to the book of Revelation and the picture of the glorified Christ is exactly what I had described to him that I had seen. And that was the first vision I had. The second one was, and remember, I didn't know that this wasn't normal. I didn't know that every Christian didn't receive this kind of stuff. And the second one was, I was on the shores of Galilee and uh, I saw Jesus in a boat. I saw him with his uh, brown olive tan skin. I saw a white tunic around his waist. I saw muscles on his legs. I saw the disciples over to my right hand side and he pulled in this whole load of fish and he looked right at me and he said, now I'm going to make you fishers of men. And, and so I, I had like, I'm thinking what in the world is going on? And from that day, from that day, 
one of the scriptures that has been the hallmark scriptures of my life was from 2 Timothy 2.15 that says, study to show yourself approved, a workman that need not be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. And that became one of the hallmarks. The other one was from the book of uh, the prophet Isaiah, chapter 58 and verse 12. It says, those from among you shall build the old waste places. They shall raise up the foundations of many generations, and you shall be called the repairer of the breach, a restorer of streets to dwell in. Little did I know that three years later, I would be in full-time ministry. And again, it was a series of miraculous. God said to me, said, I will open doors that no man can open. All I want you to do is follow them. And that is exactly what has happened in this uh, 37 years of my life now, almost 38 years of my life serving Jesus, is he's opened doors, and I I have walked through those doors. And three years after my salvation, when, remember, I knew nothing, man. I was as raw as raw could be. No church background, no first-time, first-generation preacher. But when I received, and I was shy, uh, I was an athlete, a good athlete, and and that's where I got, but behind that, I was shy and, and withdrawn. And when Holy Spirit came into my life, everything about my life changed. I mean, it metamorphosized my life. It changed me so dramatically that I I shared with everybody I could see the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, remember, we cleansed our house. We put ourselves away. We immersed ourselves in God's word. People that met us uh, three months after we were saved thought I was saved for years. They couldn't believe, where are you getting this knowledge of God's word? I just said, I'm reading the Bible. So, so, you know, we started to just uh, seek God and, and share. So we led, I don't know how many people to the Lord. Uh, the, my pastor, when we led so many people to the Lord, TJ, and got them filled with the Holy Ghost. And then if they came to our house, we, we gave them food when they left because we read that in scripture. So we, did, we were a junkie. We were junkies of this. We were junkies of this. I'm still a junkie of this. Every single year since I got saved, I have read through the Bible at least once. Uh, every single year. Uh, since I've been saved. So I can say that I've read through this Bible at least 38 times from cover to cover. I've made that a practice in my life, not because I'm a preacher, not because, you know, because I gave my life to a man that I didn't know. So I had to get to know him. And I, and I got to know him through the pages of scripture. And, uh, and the fire that's in my life, if, if that's what it's called, our passion is simply the Holy Spirit in my life that's, that's put this burning desire in my life to share the good news of the gospel, not the church nonsense. I've faced it now for, for 35 years, uh, but I, I try to lift myself above that stuff and keep myself on fire for God. So even now, uh, I mean, you know, we've got a large staff. Uh, you know, I'm in my office every day, anywhere between 4.30 and 5.30. And uh, I'm in there for one thing and one thing only, uh, to, to, to seek God and my time with God, to pray and, and to spend my, my, my time with him before my day in the office or whatever, begins to happen. And uh, so, so you know, you, you get to the point where you realize I'm not slowing down uh, in any way, shape, or form. I am more excited now than I've ever been in my entire life. And so, so from that day, the, the Bible has become and always has been the manual uh, for my life. And we have seen incredible, incredible things, uh, you know, happen. And so, you know, I, I'm a, I love studying. Uh, if you come into my house right now, uh, you'll see uh, books uh, everywhere. Uh, my library is full of books, but but it never replaces the book uh, as the number one book in my life. And uh, so so I've got a lot of books, but the, but again they're written by men, uh, you know, and so they're men's opinions and they're good and I love them. But but this this was inspired. This was written by men inspired by the Holy Ghost. And this word is fire. And not only is it fire, it puts fire in your bones. And I don't believe in this type of Christianity. I don't believe in that. I don't believe in dips and valleys. Uh, I believe in one thing, put your pedal to the metal and and, and, if, and, and and go as long as you have. Because if my life is in the hands of the Lord, it's it's up to him when I go home and, and it's up to him how long I'm, I'm on this earth. It's not up to me. So I don't fear death. I don't think about death. I think about the, the purpose of God and the will of God. So so that's that's what I've done to keep myself stirred and to grow and to be passionate. And uh, I'm preaching better now than I did all those years ago when I, was, when I was younger. I have more passion now. I have more fire now because I have more knowledge now and more understanding now of who he is. And uh, it's not more boring now. It's not like I've heard this before. There's constant nuggets that I'm finding in the word of the Lord. And every nugget is fueled with fire. And every nugget that you take and put into your spirit and begin to meditate on it and feed on it, it comes out of your word, like out of your mouth, like words of fire. And it penetrates people, whether they're saved or unsaved. 
it penetrates people. And all of a sudden, people will want to be around you because everybody likes a fire. Everybody likes to go watch a fire. But, but when they see, l- listen, we're supposed, to, we're supposed to be the aroma of Christ to a lost and dying world. We're supposed to, we're supposed to have everywhere we go, uh, because we ch- we're trying to witness instead of being a witness. Hmm. And uh, the word witness means martyr. Amen. And I don't know how many people are really getting martyred over here, but the word witness is I'm not going to witness. I am a witness. And everywhere I go, whether I walk through a mall, whether I walk down the street, there's an aroma of Christ. So my question is, who do they smell when you walk around? Do they smell you, which is rotten, stinking flesh? Or do they smell the aroma of Christ? Hey, what's different about that person or that woman? There, there's a few. There's something that comes off of you, and it draws. He said, I'll draw all men unto myself. Amen? And so they'll come to you, not because of how great you are, but because of how great the aroma that is that's around you. And they're going to say, what, without even talking about Christ or Christianity, what's different about you? And what's different about you is the aroma of Jesus Christ. And when we walk into a town, everybody ought to know that you're in town because there's an aroma. And we can walk through the mall and somebody's perfume can be really strong and you can smell it. We're supposed to be that aroma of Christ to a lost and dying nation. And when they meet us, we shouldn't be saying, oh, yeah, well, I'm struggling. You know, I'm trying trying to barely make it. Uh, You know, I'm trying to get through life or, you know, or guys my age are maybe looking at, yeah, you know, in a few more years, I'm going to retire and get some young guy to take over. And maybe they'll hire me to be the old guy. And I go, are you kidding me? I mean, I I don't have any plans uh, of retiring. Zero. None. Listen, I had open heart surgery two years ago. Uh, I had a genetic flaw in my in my uh, arteries that had to be replaced. My heart muscle was fine, but I had to get my chest split open, and I was back in the pulpit five weeks later. And I was told sit mm-hmm. on a chair. I couldn't sit on a chair. I was preaching. I was told to you know whatever. And listen, I just got my last report. I don't even have to see my doctor. It was a two year like go two years. Uh, they said you're 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 you're. The guy told me said you're so far ahead of where you should be, uh, you know, as a heart patient. Uh, you know, and I, because I've never looked back because my, my life is in God's hands. And I thought, I, I don't know how long I have, but I'm going to give it everything that I have, whether that's called fire, whether that's called passion. Uh, I call it Christianity. I call it the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I call it Acts chapter two, verse two, where we are called to do this. When that's when the spirit of God came and took those 120 people, it blew them out of that room. We're trying to stay in the room. He's trying to get us out of the room. We're trying to stay in the church. He's trying to get us out of the church. And do you realize, TJ, that before uh, COVID-19, uh, Christian, the average North American Christian went to church once every six weeks. You can't tell me, that I'm trying to think, if I, if I love my wife, do you imagine saying to my wife, I'll see you in six weeks, and trying to show up every six weeks? Not a chance. Would my marriage last? So the average Christian in North America was going to church once every six weeks. So if I wanted them to hear an entire message, I would have to preach it six weeks in a row. And now, after, after this COVID-19, the average Christian was watching six services a week because it took this to get a reset into the church and to get our fires fuel back. Wow. And we cannot go back to whatever we were before all this happened. Uh, as for me and my house, not going to happen. We're, we're, we, we're resetting and refiguring and rethinking uh, the Great Commission in the context of how God wants us to go from here on in. So that's, I don't know if that's, that's how I've grown and kept the fire of God in my life, you know, a uh, one way anyway, since I've been saved. Well, that's very powerful. People are replying. People are getting touched. I don't know if you have the comments uh, available oh, to no, you, Pastor Francis, them. but like people are really enjoying it. I even have my wife in the other room texting me saying the anointing is very powerful on this broadcast. <laughs> His testimony is very powerful. So like, uh, I'm, I can I'm, feel I'm not going to take I feel up people t- are watching right now. Can I just, I feel Go people ahead. are watching right now. And, and this, this has got to become an audience participation. You're not here to listen to two guys talking on a, on a, on a radio or on a, on a computer. I, I feel this. If, if there's an impartation that's coming, I feel there is an impartation. And we need a generation, TJ, like yourself, that are, that are committed to the fire of God. Not thinking that you're young, you don't need anybody else, you don't need this older generation. We need each other. And, and uh, we need, we, you need me and I need you. And so, Father, I, I, can I just do this? I pray for those watching right now. I pray that there's people watching. Lift your hands right where you are at home. I pray the fire of God would touch you right now in Jesus' name. Not, this is not just a broadcast. From the top of your head to the soles of your feet, no matter where you are around the world, receive receive this fire right now in Jesus' name. Now, do something with that fire. Somebody else needs it. It's not just for you. That's why, TJ, a cloven tongue of fire is not a big lighter on your head. 
a cloven tongue of fire is seven to nine feet tall. And you know why? Mm. Because it hides you. And it gives us back what the first Adam lost and the second Adam brought back. It brought back the glory of God. And the first time they knew they were naked is when the glory of God was lifted off of them and they wanted to hide and cover themselves up. And man has been hiding and covering themselves up since that day until we get the glory back. We get the glory back through the fire. And then that fire consumes you and hides you within that fire so they don't see you, they see Christ in you. That's powerful. That's powerful. Well, I'll say one thing. You know, if you were listening closely, he was giving very clear, practical keys into how he maintained the fire. And he said it, you know, he's at the office at 530 in the morning uh, when he doesn't have to be, you know, (laughs) he didn't have to be there at 530 in the morning. He takes the deliberate choice. You know, I'm going to read Psalm 23 and then we're going to go into the second uh, question. But Psalm 23 um, says that the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You're with me. You're rod and your staff comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. But listen to this. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs Mm. over. Surely goodness Mm. and mercy will follow me Mm. all the days of my life. In Psalm 92... David says that I will be anointed with fresh oil. So it's a matter of the will. He said, I will. He didn't say, I'll wait for the anointing right. of fresh oil. He didn't say, I'll, 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 I'll just stay, uh, I'll just stand by. I'll go to church. And if, if it so happens to be that my, it's my day, you know, that, mm. that's so religious to think that God has specific days for breakthrough. Yeah. Or it, that's exactly what happened when that woman that was bent over double Uh, The Bible says that she was bent over double for over 18 years. When Jesus entered into the synagogue, the moment he saw her, he felt compassion for her and said, stand up. And he laid hands on her and said, woman, you're loose. And then the Mm. religious people are the one that said, hey, hey, there's seven, there's six other days which you can be healed. That's what religion wants to tell you. There's six other days where you can get your breakthrough. There's six other days where you can get fresh oil. There's six other days where you can, you know, just wait for Sunday for you to catch the fire of God. When God is not the God of Sunday, he's not the God of Monday. He's the God of Sunday through Sunday. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And in Proverbs, it says that God will not push off till tomorrow what you're ready and willing to receive today god is ready and willing he said i'll pour out water on him that is thirsty but you have to be like david do you have to be like david was and do what he did i will be anointed with fresh oil i'm gonna take the steps necessary the required steps in order to receive fresh oil from heaven i will do what is required of me god is a very practical god he's not a mystical ethereal god that just drops things on people randomly uh as he sees fit god moves on people that are ready to move god goes with people that are ready to go god does things for people that are doing things he said if you'll diligently hearken unto the voice of the lord your god then i'll set you high you have to hearken you hearkens not just listening not just uh you know tuning into a broadcast and keeping it as a background noise as you do whatever else hearkening is i'm giving myself they that seek me with all their heart they will find me and so i'm so happy you shared those those points because they're powerful points yeah and uh he said it He, he spends time reading the word Study yep. to show yourself approved. For a fire to grow, you need yep. necessary components. Number one, you need wood. Number yep. two, you need oxygen. And then number yep. three, you need an ignition. You need uh, yep. you need a fire, a flame. God yep. is responsible for the flame. He'll 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 let the, the the thing drop. But the oxygen is prayer, and the wood is the wood is the word. Yep. For a lack of wood, the fire goes out. You and know, TJ, if there's anybody watching right now. That, that that feel like that their flame is smoldering. It's something that they once had. Here's what you need to get it back. You need the wind. That's right. And so what they need to pray is, oh, wind of God, come. And the wind of God will take that little smoldering amber that's inside of you and bring it back to the flame that it once was. That's right. Don't blame people. Don't, let, don't blame churches. Don't blame circumstances. We're in control of the fire. We're the Absolutely. ones... We're the ones who have to keep that fan. Fan into flame, Paul said to Timothy, the gift of God that is already in you. Don't let it. So Paul must have seen something in Timothy that was starting to go out. And I'll tell you why. Because Timothy had fear issues in his life. 
and he had physical issues in his life. And, and Paul's writing to him, if you understand the writing of it, was, Timothy, I'm seeing some things, and you want to talk about mentorship. Paul was seeing things in Timothy, and he was saying to Timothy, Timothy, there's an area here, right here, fan this thing into flame. And I'm speaking to somebody right now that maybe there's an amber, something happened, you, some church thing happened. The wind of God is what you need to bring that amber back into a flaming inferno for God again. That's right. That's right. And like, I love what he said. It's my, it's my responsibility. You have to yeah. take responsibility or else you'll just be a liability. Right. You need to take responsibility for your life, for you to Correct. be an asset to the earth. You know? Fan into fame the gift that is inside of you. Meaning God's yeah. put a gift in you, but there, yeah. I have to fan it to flame. It's like uh, if I just let a fire in my fireplace uh, die out, it, 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 I can't complain if there's no more heat in the house. Correct. You know, I can't complain if the presence of God's not in my house. If I let the engine room, which is prayer and the reading of the word, your devotional line, if the yeah. engine room dies out, that's why I, I love your church. I see, I follow your church, Pastor Francis. Yeah. You guys have uh, prayer meetings like, <laughs> six days a week six days a week you guys are and there's people there it's not just like some dead building there's right. people that are going they're hungry for god there's some yeah. churches that have no prayer meeting there's no, no i don't understand it's like having a car with no gasoline where are you right. gonna go you're not gonna move and Nowhere. so um and tj listen the pe your the senior pastor is not going to come over and put the log in your fire that's right because we we put everything on the senior pastors i know i've been one for a long time that's it's right. your responsibility to put the log on the fire that's right Let's go on to question number two, because okay. if we stay on this, we, we might I know, just, let's <laughs> I mean, I don't mind it. It's a great topic and people are really pressing in. We have people on YouTube watching right now. Hey, Elizabeth St. Peter, thanks for tuning in. Uh, Jane Board or Board, thanks for, th uh, for coming in. Jim, nice to see you, man. Marilyn Hallett, Isha, awesome to see you guys. Isaac Perez, let me know where you're watching from. We have a lot of new people that I see coming in on. I'd love to know where you're watching from. And uh, thanks for tuning in. If you haven't shared the broadcast yet, please share the broadcast. Things are getting hot and toasty. And so uh, we're going to move on to question number two. Pastor Francis, do you have any mentors? If so, what value has mentorship played in your own life? Because uh, many of you, you as a spiritual father, I've been around people that um, when I did your youth con uh, young adults yeah. convention, they really respect you. They revere you. They, they really treat you. Uh, as you, what you really are, a spiritual father to them. And um, what importance do you believe that mentorship has in a believer's life? What has it played in your life? And how, how do you like impart to others? And Yeah, it's huge. And, and, I'll, and I'll try to answer this quickly because I want to I wanna make sure we have time for all the questions. But And this is going to sound kind of snarky, but it's not. My, 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 my first mentors are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I like it. And, and the Apostle Paul. And then all the other, you know, the 66 books, that's, that's my first and foremost, my mentorship that I take from first. But physical people in my life, uh, Pastor Rick Shemitero, uh, Evangelist Bill Prankert, uh, Pastor Rod Parsley, uh, uh, Cletty Keith, uh, Pastor, uh, you know, in the States, he's uh, 78 years old, still pastoring, still going strong, still traveling the world. And uh, these are men that, uh, that are mentors in my life and have been for a long, long time. That when I when I when I need help, uh, when I need to talk to somebody, when I'm going through something, I can phone. I can and and I don't just phone them to complain. I listen, and then I do. Uh, and uh, these guys are in my life to correct me, to steer me, and to inspire me. And uh, so, uh, Cletty Keith, I can't tell you how many times he's called me. No idea what I'm going through, but always at the perfect moment. He always calls at the right time. Daniel had Samuel. Paul had Barnabas. Joshua had Moses. And we have to have people in our life, not not you know that are that are steering us and mentoring us. And so in our own life, in our own church, I put a huge premium on mentorship, uh, and I meet with uh, our young pastors and our young adults and leaders. Uh, as a matter of fact, our Sunday nights right now are just for our leaders and department heads, where we are pouring into them, uh, and we do this on a regular basis, not once every you know whatever, uh, but on a regular basis. We are pouring into our leadership. We've gone through, I did a thing called the School of Capernaum, and uh, I invited what was going to be 12 people, and it ended up, this is a one-year discipleship program, ended up being 16 people, and I took them through, uh, because Jesus did most of his teaching in Capernaum, and I took them through a one-year discipleship uh, where we took an, an entire year they had to meet every single Saturday, and uh, so they, by the end of that year, uh, TJ, they read had to re read the entire Bible. They read a book a month. 
we, uh, we prayed for every single nation on the planet and not only prayed for them, but prayed for their, their, the issues. Uh, and we had a missionary, we had a map of the world. Uh, we, then we did discipleship, uh, uh, teaching that was more in depth. They had to journal, and we did that for for a year. And uh, the ones that took that course are, are now staff members. Uh, you know, it it impacted their life. It changed their life. And so we do this. We have a Bible school. It's not a big Bible school, but there's a Bible school, Bible a frontline Bible training center, and where we train. Uh, as a matter of fact, our students are running. We have a healing clinic right now. It's a virtual healing clinic where you can call in like you would uh, any other uh, hospital and uh, book an appointment, and they will pray for you. But now they'll do it online in a, in a Zoom chat room, and uh, there's somebody there, and we pray for people. So our Bible school students are running that healing clinic. And uh, over the years, we've seen many, many healings and miracles happen, and uh, and I let them run it. Mentorship is not you looking over their shoulder. And, and, and no, I let them make mistakes. Uh, I, I give them the, the rope to be able to do things and to learn. Uh, and these are great, great, great young adults and great young people. Our staff, uh, TJ, most of my staff has been with me anywhere from uh, anywhere from three years to almost 25 years. Wow. Uh, we virtually have had zero, uh, you know, t- uh, turnover. And uh, there are great, great staff that we've, you know, we've mentored, uh, you know, and as well as other leaders uh, on a regular basis. So it's a huge part of what we do in the ministry. But but I, I do what, what was what was done with me. That's how I was mentored. So I can only do uh, what was done with me. And, and I was a, and I still am, I'm a Bible. I, I, right now I, I've got, um, as a matter of fact, Willington Boone, who I saw on Isaiah, uh, I, I bought his journal and it's a pretty intense journal. And it actually, one of the things in the journal is if you at any point in 30 days, uh, the 30 day journal, uh, don't complete it. You have to start all over again. So I challenged my leaders last Sunday night and, and, uh, I think we've got 30 books coming in and we're going to go through this 30 day journal uh, you know, as as a, as a leadership team, and uh, so we're really here in the next couple of weeks. So it's something we've always done. It's something I enjoy doing. I've done it my entire Christian life before I was ever in the ministry, um, and uh, I would I would be doing what I'm doing right now, whether I was a pastor or not, uh, because the the Holy Spirit's in my life, and the Holy Spirit always steers us towards, uh, you know, sharing the gospel with lost people. And uh, so we're excited about what what's going to happen here in the days ahead. So that's that's in a nutshell. You know, so yes, I have people in my life that I call, they call me, and uh, iron sharpens iron. And so you can't have mentors in your life if you're not willing to hear sometimes the things you don't want to hear. One question, what would you say to somebody who tells you something like, uh, well, I, I don't need a mentor. I don't need, you know, I don't need anybody. I have the Holy Spirit. I don't need a human person to tell me and guide me and stuff. I have the Holy yep. Spirit. I don't need yep. to go to, ch- you know, there's a lot of people in this day and age, they have like this new movement where they don't even want to go to church. Like I yep. don't need a church. I don't even need a pastor. Yep. I can start. Yep. I, I just need, you know, I have online. I can yep. pop on, you know, some famous preacher uh, yep. stream and get pretty good quality music and content and just in my home. I don't need pretty much a human connection. I have the Holy Spirit. What would you tell that person? Well, I would tell them, first of all, you don't know the Bible and uh, you're more new agey than you are, um, you know, which is kind of like this thing all by yourself than you are biblical because all through the Bible, uh, like I just said, uh, you know, Samuel and David, uh, Moses and Joshua. Remember, it was Barnabas and Saul until Saul or Paul, Barnabas and Paul, until Paul was mature enough to take leadership and then it became Paul and Barnabas. And wherever in the Bible the first name is mentioned, he's the mentor and the second one is the disciple. And then, of course, let's look at Jesus himself. He trained 12 men. And uh, then those 12 men trained other men. And then there were 70. Then there was 120. And when the big multitudes came, up to 10,000 people, and Jesus said, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you can have no part of me, they all disappeared. And uh, so so he was training those 12, even though they didn't understand everything, to what was going to happen on the, day of, uh, on the day of Pentecost. And you can follow it down. Silas, Timothy, you can go all the way down. Paul discipled these people right? Aquila, Priscilla, they can go down through the list of people. It's all the way through that, that needed discipleship because it's a model all through scripture of being mentored and being someone there. And if you're not being mentored, then you're a uh, illegitimate son. And uh, you can rant and rave and you can quote scripture and you can do all of it, but, but God doesn't take what he's laid out and make the exception because somebody thinks that they're the exception. It's for everybody. And all of us need to be mentored, mentoring, and uh, on a regular basis. And uh, and that means that somebody that you're willing to say when they say to you, hey, there's some areas of your life I want to talk to you about, not to condemn you, but to help steer you. Uh, a wise person accepts that. The problem in the body of Christ right now is we don't have any of that. We have people running around 
with no head chip, uh, saying and do and and really bringing fractions all over the place, staying at home, not not gathering together. Uh, and the Bible says we're supposed to assemble together more as you see the day approaching, and uh, that's the day of the Lord. So we should be assembling more, not less. That's right. I, that's right. You said it very well. Um, this next question is going to bless a lot of people. This is a great time to share the broadcast because I'm really looking forward to what you have to say on this. Um, having, you know, been in the ministry for so long. And not only that, you've been baptized in the Holy Ghost and have been used by God in many miracles and signs and wonders. And uh, I, you know, I could go off and tell you some testimonies I've seen uh, over the years. God is, a, I want you, before I get into, before I, I, I pull it over to you, I, I want you to understand that God is a miracle working God. The Bible says that when Moses encountered God, God did not reveal himself to be the I will be. He did not mm. reveal himself to be the I was. He revealed himself to be the I am that I am. So yeah. what God was in Moses' day is what who God is today. Jesus yeah. hasn't changed. The Bible says he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. The Bible yeah. says, I am the Lord your God who changes not. Um, when Jesus walked the shores of Galilee, the Bible says the anointing was upon him to heal all that were oppressed of the devil. The Bible yeah. says that this beginning of signs and wonders did Jesus in Cana yeah. of Galilee and manifested his glory to his disciples. The way God, people cry all the time, Lord, show us your glory, show us your glory. And they're expecting mm. some like smoke or fog to come into the place or gold dust or feathers or whatever. And I'm not against, uh, you know, I, my one of my, on. men, my mentor, Tiff Shuttlesworth, he, he had his encounter with God where uh, in his old, the old Bible College, Zion Bible College, which is now today North Point Bible College, there was a cloud that invaded the place and it was the true glory of God. And for two weeks, that cloud did not lift. And that's where God gave him a vision to, to win a million souls. So I'm not against mm. those things, but I'm saying the real glory of God. When Moses prayed, show me your glory. He was talking about changed lives, people's bodies being healed, people's lives being transformed. When Lazarus rose from the dead, that's the glory of God. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Mary, when Jesus came to raise Lazarus from the dead, Mary said, Lord, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection yep. of the just. She was pushing it off for some, yes, we understand, but it'll be in the future. Mo, uh, Jesus said, no, no, no. I am the resurrection yep. and the life. And I'm here now. You don't have to wait till then. Yes, there will be a final resurrection, but I'm here now to raise Lazarus from the dead. There might be a dead kidney in your body. There might right. be a dead brain. There might be a dead... Uh, uh, dead cartilage in your knees, whatever, whatever it is, dead eardrum, dead eye, eye, eye nerves, whatever it might be that's dead in your life. Lazarus did not need healing. Lazarus needed resurrection power. Yeah. The doctors might have said there's no chance in on this earth that you will be healed. There's no chance that you'll be healed. There's no chance you'll ever walk again. There's no chance, whatever they've told you. But the Bible doesn't say who has believed your doctor's report. The Bible says who has believed the report of the Lord. So yeah, as he goes yeah. and answers this question and begins to release testimonies of what he's seen and God working through him, I want you to set your faith that what God did for yeah. them, he is not one who shows personal favoritism. Mm. What God does for one, he'll do for all. The Bible says that if we will have have faith all things are possible faith is not just the ability to believe that God is able but that God is willing and he's willing to do it for me now and here so yeah. the next question is pastor Francis tell me some of the greatest miracles that you've seen financial healing body whatever it might be take it away Okay, let me, let me talk to you about, uh, and this is exciting for, for me, this part. I was waiting for this part because these are testimonies of things that I've seen, I've been a part of. And, and I've just got five or six of them that I'm going to tell really quickly. And uh, the first one was I was in uh, Swiss Chalet with, uh, with one of my mentors, actually. And uh, we were having lunch. He had been at my church and ministered. And we were sitting in there uh, just talking back and forth. And a busload of senior citizens came into the, to the restaurant. And they all took their seats and uh, they were sitting down. They did their order. And uh, they, they got their orders brought to them. And just when this lady that was sitting sort of kitty corner from me got her order uh, and I was watching, all of a sudden she fell, her face plumped right into her plate. Uh, and everybody around her started to panic. They were screaming her name out. She was not moving a muscle, gone. They were all like just freaking out. The staff was freaking out. And uh, th there was no sign of life there whatsoever. So they called 911. And, uh, and uh, so... Now, I'm sitting there, and the Lord says to me really clearly, go pray for her. I'm thinking to myself, tell, them, tell my mentor to go pray for, for her. 
And uh, the Lord said, go pray for her. And this crowd was, you know, was, was uh, fairly panicky. And they kept calling her name and calling her name and calling her name. And uh, she, she wasn't moving. And she'd been, I mean, literally her whole face was in her plate, mashed potatoes, chicken, whatever she had had. So the Lord kept speaking to me, go over there and pray for her. So I got up and I, and I kind of weaved my way through the crowd. And I said to the lady that was with her, uh, you know, I said, can I pray for her? And she goes, what, what? And I said, I'm a minister. Can I pray for her? She goes, yes, I, yes, whatever. I don't care. And so I got her name. I, all I did, TJ, is I whispered her name in her ear. And I said, wake up in Jesus' name. And I sat back down. And all of a sudden, as I hear the ambulance coming, I hear it coming. It's, it's getting closer and closer. She's sitting there. She sits up suddenly and takes a great big gasp of breath. She wipes the stuff off of her face. By then, the ambulance guys are coming in. She's breathing. She's fine. She's arguing with them. She doesn't want to leave. She wants to eat her food. I mean, it was, it was hilarious. But, and, and then they checked her and did, made sure she was okay. And she came back in and was able to eat her food. So I know that she was gone. I know there was no life in her at all. She was down there for a long, long time. Uh, let me give you another one. It's a lady in our church. Her name is Karen Williams. Karen's been with us for many, many years. One day I got it, but she's battled cancer in her body. I got a phone call. Uh, and to come to the hospital to see her. So I went down to the hospital. When I went in there, and when you've been in a hospital enough times, you know that it doesn't look good. And she, death was in the room. And uh, they said to Karen on Thursday, get your affairs in order. You're not going to live for the, week, the weekend. Get your family together because you're probably not going to be here on Monday. This was on a Thursday. So I went down to the hospital, TJ, and I saw her there. And I'm telling you, death was in the room. I, I've been in many, many rooms where people have died and that was in that room. And I looked at her and I said, Karen, tell me what you want. And she said, I want to live. And this is what I said, in Jesus' name, live. And I left. And I came back on Friday. And Friday, she was sitting up on a chair beside her bed. And I looked at her and I said, she was completely visibly different. And I said, Karen, you look completely different. And she said, I feel different. She goes, ever since you prayed for me, I feel better. TJ, that was like, I don't know how many years. That was over 10 years ago. And Karen was just in our church Sunday morning. That's awesome. Uh, you know, still, still. And she's had some physical issues, but cancer left her body. And it was a, a, a tremendous miracle. Another uh, guy, a gentleman, 83 years old, came to us. I didn't know anything about him. Apparently, he was an Anglican. He came to us. He had leukemia. I didn't know he had leukemia. I'd never seen this man before. He came in a Wednesday Bible study. And uh, he came up to the front. And uh, I prayed for him, and he went down under the power of God. And uh, he was back again on Sunday morning. And so I prayed to them on Sunday morning. Down he went under the power of God. Prayed for him again Sunday night. Down he went under the power of God. Didn't know anything about him. What I didn't know is that he had leukemia, and that his white blood cell count was so high, he, he actually showed me the doctor's report. So in between there, he had to go for a blood test. So he went for a blood test, and the doctor said, hey, Harry, um, something's, something's weird here with your blood. And he goes, why? What do you mean? He goes, well... It's it's reversed itself since the last time you were here. That's awesome. And he said, I want to do more at work. So in the meantime, Harry came back to church on the, the second Wednesday. I prayed for him again, and he went down under the power of God. And to make a long story short, I did that about five or six times. And then the day finally came where, where Harry brought me the white blood cell count that he had, and it was down to zero and was declared cancer-free. Uh, at 83 years old, he took two years of our Bible school, and uh, I mean, just a tremendous miracle and uh, of great faith from a man who could have said at 83, oh, well, at least I've had a good life. And he fought that thing. And uh, another testimony is a lady that was brought into our, 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 our hospital from Brockville who was dying of, uh, who, had, who had meningitis in her body and her body was shutting down. So they didn't, she couldn't move her arms. Uh, it was just a slow progress downwards. They brought her in and her husband came to church uh, Sunday morning and he said, would you please come to uh, the hospital this afternoon to pray for my wife? I'm afraid she's going to die. So I went there, and when I got there, I had to dress up. She was quarantined. I had to dress up in all the special stuff. My wife and I, we went into the room, uh, and uh, she, could, she was really, really weak. She, I, I said to her, what happened? And she said, she whispered to me. She goes, I said, I felt something come in my body. And she goes, ever since then, my body's shutting down. I said, tell it to leave. And she whispered. She could barely get it out. In Jesus' name, leave. We anointed the bedposts of her bed with oil, went back to church. Ten minutes into the start of the Sunday night service, her husband showed up. And I said to him, hey, how, what are you doing here? How's your wife? He said, pastor, 
20 minutes after you left, my wife sat up in bed and asked for a Tim Hortons coffee. Hmm. She had not ate food. Her body was breaking down. Hey, come on, somebody. And there she was out of the hospital two days later. I mean, these are not miracles from someone else. These are things that I have seen with my own eyes. I was in, I was in uh, uh, Brussels, uh, and I was preaching in Brussels. I was in the airport, actually, that was blown up. And uh, there was a pastor from another church came to one of the services. And he said to me, Pastor, could you come and pray for this man in the hospital from my church? And I said, well, then he called me back and said, well, as a matter of fact, you're not allowed to go in there. Could you pray for him by phone? So, uh, so here's what happened. He was over in Africa because his parents, their parents had died. And uh, he went over there to settle the land, the land deal that his dad owned because as the eldest son, he was the inheritor of the land. Well, when he got over there, his younger brother was mad and, and uh, jealous, so he poisoned him. And by the time they landed in Brussels, he the, was met by an ambulance because he was manifesting in the poison on the on the and they didn't know what kind of poison it was. So he was body was breaking down. He was dying. So I got on the phone with him and uh, and, and he told me briefly it was really weak voice. And I prayed with him. And, and in you know, Jesus name, I rebuked the poison. I prayed for healing to flow and flow through his body. The next day, that pastor came back to service. And that man was up out of the bed just a few minutes after that prayer and out of the hospital the next day. These, TJ, these are not someone else's miracles. My, uh, you know, we've been going to Guatemala for many years. I've been in Africa, South Africa, in a church of uh, 8,000 people and watched just through the preaching of God's word, the mm-hmm. shrieks of demons flying out of people at the power of the resurrected Jesus without me having to have an altar call. I watched the power of God manifest and just hit people. I've seen more demons cast out of people than I know what to do with, with a word. Uh, it's not a 40 day process right. with a word because you have to know the word to know how to use the word to cast out devils with the word. And so we, we, we've seen these miracles. My wife and I both, we, we go to Guatemala all the time. We have a children's home there. We're part of crusades that up to, you know, five, six, 7,000 people. We have seen, listen, my wife prayed for a girl who had never walked, TJ. She was 12 years old or 14, never walked. Amen. I didn't know what had happened to her. I saw my wife bringing her to the stage because we were going to get her to come up and testify. I didn't know what the miracle was. And my wife said she couldn't walk. And God touched her when I prayed for her. I grabbed her by the hand and I ran all over the backfield with her uh, during the crusade. And the power of God was all over her because my wife had prayed for her and she was instantly healed. In those crusades, TJ, with our eyes, my church, okay, my church has seen a girl in my church laid her hand on a, on, a, on a person born blind, had no iris in her eye, never had it, put her hand on there. And, and when she took her hand away, TJ, this is powerful. She saw the iris developing circular like this in her eye as God formed her eyesight. We have seen, because diabetes is That's so awesome. high, uh, diabetes is so high in Guatemala. We've seen so many people that were blind see. We have had wheelchairs lined up on the platform with the lame walking again crutches and canes. I have canes in my sanctuary, hung up on the side of my sanctuary for people that used to use them that don't have them anymore. In my own church, many, many testimonies of healing, because if we're, if we're not seeing people healing, healed, we're not preaching the gospel. So these are not, these are not someone else's miracles. These are things that I've seen with my own eyes. And some of the greatest financial miracles that I have witnessed are in my own church. We do a thing called the power of a resurrection seed every, every Passover, uh, some call it Easter. I don't call it Easter. I call it what the Bible does. It's Passover. Uh, Easter is co- after the, uh, the, 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 the fertility god of Estar. And uh, it shouldn't be in the Christian vo- vocabulary because that's why there's little chocolate Easter eggs because she was the goddess of fertility. And that is, that, that's what Constantine put in when he didn't want the blessing to be on the church. And he, everybody thought it was a feast of the Jews. It's a feast of the Lord. And so we celebrate Passover. And so we, we, you know, we have seen resurrection seed. We've seen a hundred plus thousand dollar offerings on our resurrection uh, Sundays. I mean, it, it's just incredible giving by this by this church that I pastor with many people that are debt free. I mean, we have seen so many financial miracles. Uh, here's what happened: our first year of ministry, I think we brought in ninety seven thousand dollars. TJ, our second year we brought in two hundred ninety seven thousand. Our third year. We brought in $506,000. Our fourth year, we brought in $508,000. But that year, I got a revelation of giving to the house of Israel. So that year, we started giving 10% of our 10% directly to the house of Israel. And that year, we jumped from $508,000 to over a million dollars in our giving, and it's never gone back. As a matter of fact, it's increased 
because we have given to Israel, different ministries in Israel, right directly there ever since that time. So financial miracles, I could sit here all day and talk to you about financial miracles of people in our church that I've seen that are debt-free today, that are business owners, that own their own business, that, that you know, we're working for someone else at one point. I think we have like, I don't know how many, you know, different business owners in our church that have just ra- risen up businesses and, and, and they are givers like you would not believe because they saw the key that you cannot give God. When you, when you, when you obey the scriptures, you can live far greater on less by far because the miracle of the resurrection seed. Absolutely. So those are just some of the things that I've seen over the last we have, you know, few years. We have someone on the live stream to just uh, ask, please pray for my friend's baby, Elijah. They're in the NICU, six days old. And, They're from uh, our church. Amy, okay, that's from your church. And then yeah. also we have, so if you wanna pray for that, and then uh, yeah. we also have a question from uh, William Matthews who messaged me just now saying, what if we pray for a sick person and the anointing shows up, but they're still sick after prayer, what went wrong? And uh, before you answer that, I'll just answer it quickly, uh, what I think. And um, it. what I'll just say before you, you take over is... Yeah, go ahead. When something doesn't go right, it's never God. Right. When things don't go right, it's never God. If someone doesn't get healed, it's never God. You can... Because the Bible makes it very clear what God's will is concerning our physical health. Third John verse two, beloved, I would I pray that you would prosper and be in good health, even as your soul prospers. Right. So God's will, you know, Jesus went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. The Son of God was made manifest to destroy the work of the devil. So God's will is to, uh, to to destroy the work of the devil, and sickness is the work of the devil. So when someone doesn't get well, you can never lay blame on God. Uh, Correct. That being said, when Mark chapter 9, when a boy was brought to Jesus' disciples and they couldn't help him or cast the demon out, what happened when they brought the boy to Jesus? He didn't say, yep. oh, it's because it wasn't my will. He says, right. you faithless and unbelieving generation, bring the boy to me. But every time the boy was brought to Jesus, every time a person was brought to Jesus, the situation always turned around in their favor. The boy was delivered yep. and he was presented back to his father uh, well. And so, and then they came to him privately and said, why, did, why could we not cast it out? Cast right. it out. Not that they didn't try. They couldn't do it. Jesus said, because of your unbelief, for this kind cometh not out but through prayer and fasting. So when I lay hands on people and I don't see a miracle, I don't blame the person. I don't blame God. I fast and I, unless of course the person right. is just like, I don't believe and I'm not going to, I'm never going to heal. Like they totally in unbelief and totally like, then right. there's nothing we can really help. You can't help someone who doesn't want to believe. Right. You can't help someone. But if they're on board with you and still, then I have to go before the Lord and, and pray and fast, just like Jesus did. That's where prayer and fasting comes in. Yep. Jesus prayed and fast, and he returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and then he began to have miracles. So he took time yep. to pray and fast, and the disciples not above his master. Whatever we saw the master do, we as disciples have to do in like manner if we're going to expect to receive the same level of miracles, healings, and breakthrough. Pastor Francis, if you want to just add on to that and then pray for... Yep. Uh, the ladies, uh, because really n- nothing went wrong. Uh, that, that's that's the first thing I want to say. Nothing went wrong because you 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 do what uh, what God called you to do. Do you remember the time Jesus prayed for the man and when he opened his eyes, uh, he could only see trees. That's right. uh, and then he prayed to prayed to him uh, again, and his and his and his eyes cleared up. Uh, I've seen many many times, and I'll give an example. Uh, Karen Karen Williams, when I prayed for her, nothing happened at that point. But the next day, she was sitting up on that bed, and she's still she's still alive all these years later. Do you remember the lepers that came to him and he said, go show yourself to the priests? We don't have any indication they got healed there. No, they got healed on their way. That's right. On their way to the priest. And then they came back and two of them and, and, and glorified God and, and thanked the Lord. So sometimes, uh, you know, you have to pray for people and the manifestation of that healing has already taken place. He already paid the price for it. That's right. And sometimes it happens within sometimes a 24, 48 hour period. Uh, and uh, and if there's no manifestation of it, we pray again. We keep praying, but it's never God's fault or God's problem. That's right. Uh, and you're right. Sometimes it's a faith issue. Sometimes it's other factors that we don't have time to get into. But God is always, always, always answers prayers. As a matter of fact, He already did. He paid the price for it already. That's right. Can join me pray for Elijah, Father? I pray for Elijah again. I thank you for the miracle that you've already done in this little baby's life. I thank you that the jaundice in his body is already uh, going away. Now, Father, we pray for these lungs. I speak over them again. You will breathe, little Elijah, and you will breathe properly. And we pray all the fluid 
out of those lungs right now and that he can go home with mom and dad in the name of Jesus. We thank you for it, God. And we've already seen, we prayed for him last night, TJ. I already saw a difference this morning because they, they, they let Amazing. me know. And so we're going to see him at home here real quick. Amazing. And then there's someone here, uh, Christine, praying for <laughs> eyesight. Uh, if you have any prayer requests, just put them in and we'll, we're going to pray for them. If we don't get to them right now at this moment, at the end of the broadcast, I'll list them all out and uh, we'll pray up so Christine's eyesight. Um, if you want to go ahead yeah, and John, pray. Do you want me to pray, Christine? Father, I pray for Christine right now in the name of just Jesus. Just pray for everybody, actually. Just anybody Yeah, Father, sick. everybody watching, God. I've seen so many miracles, God. Eyes, limbs, legs over the years. Father, I thank you that no matter what's going on with anybody watching, Father, we speak healing right now. Father, I join my faith with theirs right now. If you're watching, lift your hands up wherever you are. And then in the name of Jesus, receive your healing. Father, the same fresh fire, the same wind, the same way you've touched my life many, many times physically over the years. Others that I've seen, Father, touch the people that are listening right now in Jesus' name. Wind of God, blow into that room. Father, touch them right now, and we speak healing over you from your eyes to the top of your head, the soles of your feet, whatever is not functioning. We speak function in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to skip down to the last question. Sure. Uh, for the sake of time, and I know a lot of people yep. are still complaining, uh, not complaining, but like <laughs> they're still noticing that there's like a skip. <laughs> A skip or whatever on the broadcast i don't know what it is so i can't really fix it right now uh however i'm pretty sure on youtube it's flowing smoothly because we're not getting any anybody uh saying anything there so i'm pretty sure even if after you want to re-watch the whole thing you can go on youtube our youtube page is tj malkanji and you can subscribe to it there and um rewatch the whole broadcast as many times as you want it's a very powerful broadcast uh i've been super blessed by it the anointing's very strong, uh, and and I believe people are going to get healed. People are, are already being yes. set free. I believe that people are already getting a fresh fire lit on, lit on them. And um, so I would encourage you if you had problems. See, my dad's on YouTube and he's saying it's good stream, no problems here. So YouTube's ob it always has a better. I don't know what it is. They're like a better platform. Uh, so it's probably better to even watch it on YouTube from this point onward because they're just everything's better quality on YouTube, anyways. But uh, those were powerful testimonies, you know, and like I said before, what God did for, uh, for those people, you know, God is ready and willing to do it for you today. God yep. does not show personal favoritism. That one, that man in Mark chapter one came to Jesus and said, Lord, if you're willing, you can help me. You can make me clean yep. before Jesus helped him before Jesus healed him before Jesus stretched forth his hand and touched him he had to correct his theology his poor doctrine which was God I don't know if you're willing and he said right. I am willing and then he was moved right. with compassion and touched him so before he healed him that's where that's another thing I'll add on to that question like what happens if people don't get healed and stuff uh th faith has to be alive in their hearts and faith comes by hearing and understanding the word of god a lot of times people rush into praying for sick people without explaining from the word of god you know jesus didn't just go about healing people he actually took time to teach in their synagogues preach the gospel of the kingdom and then right. he would heal every kind of sickness and every right. disease luke chapter yes. 5 verse 12 they came first to hear him and to be healed by them by him of their infirmities so you yeah. know we have archived stuff on our youtube page that you can go up on if it's god's will to heal me uh dominion over sickness and disease i would encourage you to go and listen to those things as yeah, you good. listen to them faith will be built into your spirit man so that you can exercise that dominion over sickness and disease because you have dominion over Satan, sickness, and disease. The Bible says in Romans 5, 17, that through Jesus Christ, we now reign in life. We reign yep. over the things that used to reign over, over us. We're no longer, uh, uh, we're no longer uh, slaves to sin. We're no longer slaves right. to anything sin brought on the earth, which is sickness, right. disease, death, decay. I'm not a slave to those things. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of Allah. So you have to build yourself up in that faith so that it's just, it's just like it's knowledge to you. It's, it's in your yep. spirit. It's, it's, um, you know, the Bible says that God would fill you with all the knowledge of his word so that you may right. walk in a manner worthy of his will. So as you get filled with his word, you start to walk in his will and then the devil can't do anything about it. Once, you know, they that do know their God shall be strong. The Bible says the right. entrance of his word brings light. Light's the solution to darkness any day, any time, anywhere. Right. So the more you get filled up with the light, my, David said, thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. The more that light guides your way, the less power 
the less authority, the less control Satan yeah. will have on you. And when you get to a point where you're just illuminated and full of light, he has no... That's why Jesus said, the, the, God, uh, the God of this age, the prince of this world has come, but he has nothing in me. Nothing, Meaning there's no right. room for darkness in me. I'm full mm. of light. You can get to mm -hmm. that same level. Um, let's go with the last question today. And uh, it's, it's a good one. And if I believe some of you, you've come onto this broadcast because A, you, you, you've grown weary and you, you want the fire of God. B, you already have the fire of God, but you're always wanting more. And then C, I believe God's called you because he's wa he wants to use you in this last day army. The Bible yep. says in the last days, God will pour out his spirit on all flesh. And, uh, and he's still looking for people to use. Gideon was someone hiding yep. in a wine press, didn't know how to be used by God. But when the Spirit of God came to him, uh, he turned that, you know, a lot of times people have this frustration with what's going on in the world, but they don't know how to act on it. So they what? They protest in the streets. I'm not against yep. protesting, but they protest in the streets. They, they uh, you know, start some uh, charity in the name of helping X, Y, Z. Yep. But that's not the way you can help the world as a Christian, as a born again believer. The way you help the world is by enlisting in the army of God and going yeah. and walking in his calling. So, Pastor Francis, how do I know God is calling me into the ministry? What are yeah. like some obvious signs that God's calling me yeah. into the ministry and what should yeah. I do next? Okay, let me let me take it with the, the, the question just really quickly. You asked me, what do I do uh, when I get discouraged? Because that's that, you know, and there are times when in ministry you're fighting against principalities and powers. There's discouragement that tries to shut in. And this is key to answering this last question. And what I do personally is I shut myself in with God and I do not come out until that thing is lifted. And 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 I, I encourage myself in the Lord through praise and through worship. And I don't come out, I don't care if it's an hour or four hours until that thing is lifted and I don't get discouraged very often. Um, so usually, so well, let me answer, answer it this way. How do I know God's calling me to ministry? And usually others will know it first. Uh, I, I'm always leery of those that are super ambitious to get into the ministry. Uh, and I want to know their motive. Uh, and I certainly go through this with our young adults and our, and our students. Uh, usually others will know first. My, my first pastor, Pastor Keith Webb, who mentored me for, for several years, he, he knew. Uh, and he led me through, first of all, what it was to be called to the ministry and the cost. And... Um, TJ, I used to have um, I used to have visions. This is you know this is just early on, like the first three months, four months of me being saved. Visions of myself preaching to masses of people. Now I had never touched a microphone, and uh, and then and then I would be you know. So here's what God does. If you want this is what prophecy is. God shows you the future, and then He brings you back to the present, and He said, "Now keep your eyes on that goal," and so. It, it kept me from being discouraged. It kept me from being sidetracked. It kept me from running around from here and there. So he took me to my future and things that he showed me during that time, I have lived today. Uh, you know, this is before I ever were, touched a microphone, ever preached. The first time I ever preached, it was a seven minute sermon. I sat down. So before any of that happened, God showed me, I'd be preaching to, to masses. He brought me back and then he brought me through a series of, of you need to now learn and understand what it is to be a disciple. And, and uh, it goes back to the mentoring. And so I sat under my, the guidance of my pastor as he mentored me through the call of God on my life. And um, he will show you where, where, where he wants you to be. And he'll open doors, uh, you know, and you have to keep your eyes on that thing because people will come, amen, and they'll want to sidetrack you. And I had in the early days people pulling on me, pulling on me, pulling on me, I had to keep my eyes focused on what God had called me to do. So there's an inner witness that once I understood what a call of God was, uh, and you got to remember, TJ, we use the Bible as a manual, right? So everywhere we went, we would ask people, have you given your life to Christ? Uh, and if they said yes, and or they were Christians, I'd say, have you received the gift of the Holy Spirit? And uh, and, and we would show them biblically. We, we didn't care uh, we about Baptist, Pentecost. We didn't know about that stuff. And we would show them, this is, what, this is what it says. And so we would use it like a manual that it is for life, and we would follow that through. And then other people started to realize, because I had an insatiable appetite for God's Word, uh, and I wanted to, I was constantly in it. Uh, and, and so out of that, I had no idea that I was growing. So when I took over the youth ministry in that church, we went from 25 to zero. 
because they wanted to play games and, and fool around. And I said, guys, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take you through the book of John. And uh, verse by verse, I took them through the – so we started with 25, ended up with zero. And I found one kid, one kid I discipled for a year, one year. Disciple. He's still, you know, one year. I poured my life into him for one year. All of a sudden, number two came, number three came, number four came. So TJ, every youth group I ever pastored went from went from we either doubled, tripled, or quadrupled. And I discipled them. As a matter of fact, the one church I was in, we had 150 kids coming every single That's week. Awesome. One we had two services every week. Many of those, many of those young people are in my church today as leaders in my church that I was once their youth pastor years ago. Uh, and many of the ones in those years, so other people will recognize there's a call of God and then there's fruit to the call, there's fruit. And you have to follow, and I, so it's not it's not about, there's a lot of guys that go to Bible school, I'm not against Bible school, I have one. But not everybody who goes to Bible school is called to be in full-time ministry. We're all, I mean, I mean doing what I, what I say I'm doing, I'm, I'm referring to that. Everybody's in ministry, I understand that people watching, everybody's in ministry, but I'm talking about what I'm doing. And there's an inner knowing that you are put on this earth for something more than what you're doing right now. You need somebody to help develop that knowing. And that's where mentorship is so, so important in the early stages of the call of God. There are no lone wolves in the kingdom. You need somebody to help mentor that gift. You know, somebody that knows when to squeeze it, when to release it, when to hold it back. That's right. And as you grow, because of you, if, the, if somebody lets you go too soon, it could destroy you. I've seen a lot of young guys and young women shipwrecked uh, because they were left on their own. You need to be walked through with godly mentors as they see that gift in you, and then you you let them go. And I see this with the young guys and young people in my church that I'm letting go. I say, go ahead, do that, go. And uh, and they're starting to grow. So you need to you need to know that others will normally see it in you first. And then you've got to have that inner, it'll witness with you that, yeah, that, that, that's exactly what I feel too. Because I didn't know what a call to the ministry was. And uh, I just knew that, God, I will do whatever you want me to do. And, and it doesn't come without hard work, TJ. There's a lot, of, like, you've got to be, this is my life. I, I don't do this on Sunday. This is, this is my life. This is how we live. This is how my wife and I live. You know, we are, two of my kids are on staff with me out of the three kids that I have. And this is what we do. And uh, so the so the evidence is there, the fruit is there, uh, right. uh, you know. After all these years, because a lot of guys don't last in ministry, but a few years they're done, they're finished, kaput, they're burnt out, they ran too fast, too hard, and they and they but they were probably never called. If you're called, Amen. God carves a path out for you, and you follow it. It doesn't mean it's easy. Yeah, and another thing is like you might be watching right now, and you don't necessarily feel a call to the ministry, but I right. want you to know that you, God has a calling for you. Nonetheless, Correct. and that calling is for you, you know, Deuteronomy 28, one says, if you'll diligently hearken unto my voice and follow my right. leading, I'll set you high above the nations yeah. of the earth. You know, it, yeah. it's a shame because the best accountants should be in the church. The yep. best hotel uh, businesses should be Holy Ghost Christians that raise up those businesses. In this Correct. last day and hour, the Bible says that there's going to be a switcheroo where the wealth of the yep. wicked is going to come yep. into the hands of the righteous. But for that to happen, there needs to be people that rise up and say, you know, I feel there's a passion in my heart. There's something right. I want to do. There's a creative idea that I have, an idea for a yep. business, an idea for a, for a, a product or whatever. But yep. I don't know. Does God want me to have that wealth? Uh, no, I want to stay humble. And, and, and if I got all that wealth, you know, God needs businessmen and businesswomen yep. who have wealth so that they can, you know, there are people. I mean, who do you think Mom. funded Kenneth? Um, uh, what's his name? Reinhard Bonnke's uh, crusades overseas. Do yep. you think he went into the African nations and they were just rolled out a red carpet and were like, hey, my friend, just come no. on in. This is Brother Bonnke. No. He's here to do the work of. No, he had to rent out stages. He had to rent yep. out. Uh, buses to get all the people in there but that takes money and the love it of does. money is the root of all evil however money itself is a useful tool and god needs you know deuteronomy 8 18 says that the lord your god will give you power to create power. wealth there's an anointing and a yep. calling for people to yep. create wealth to produce on the earth i uh psalm 87 says in that day speaking of mount zion in that day yep. 
The Bible says that all the springs, all the fountains of the earth will be found in her, meaning all yeah. the source of good things will be found in the church. If people want a good landscaper, they're going to have to go to a Christian. If people oh, want a on. good uh, uh, accountant, they're going to have to go to a Christian. If people want a good uh, whatever, a good a, a lawyer, they're going to have to go to yep. a Christian because every top agent in every yep. expert's field, in every professional field will be one that's pertaining and connected to the body of Christ. And so Come you on. might be here saying, man, I'm not in the, I don't feel called to a ministry, but I feel a call to do something great for God. Well, great for God. Do you understand Abraham wasn't a preacher? Do you understand yep. David wasn't a preacher necessarily? He was a king. Uh, yes, he was a priest and he was a prophet, but he, like he was a king. You know, you, you look at guys like, um, uh, in the Bible, like uh, Solomon. Solomon wasn't a preacher. Solomon was just a king, but God used yep. him. Gideon wasn't a preacher. Samson wasn't a preacher. These guys yep. were kings. God has a place for you in the body of Christ. Yep. And the hand can't say the foot, I have no need of you That's because right. I'm, not a, I'm, not a, uh, I'm not a foot or I don't need a foot. Marketplace the, you, ministers. You know, I can't say to my my uh, kidneys, oh, I don't need you because, you know, I have no need for you. I don't see a need for you. No, I need a kidney. And the Bible says even the most uh, unpresentable parts, God bestows yep. greater honor on. You know, the Bible yep. says we are all members of the body of Christ in particular. Yep. So it doesn't matter what God's calling you to do. The, the point is, is that never let religion or men diminish you into thinking that God's calling right. for you is very mediocre or small or not very big. God has a place for you at the top if you're interested yep. in it. But it takes you, we need we need more than ever Christian politicians. We need yes. Christian governors. We need Christian presidents. We need Christian deputies. We need Christian yep. people that are going to influence legislation. Ultimately, yes, legislation doesn't change a heart, but it does help. And so if we it, get people... You know, and for so many years, if someone wanted to go into government, no, 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 you know, it's not good. You shouldn't think high, more highly of yourself than you ought to be. Just, you know, do the bare minimum. We're not living for this life in here and now. Yep. And so they've been beat down into thinking small. But in yep. reality, God told Abraham, get out of the tent, look up, yep. see the stars. As many as the stars are, so are the descendants that I'll bring forth from you. And consider hey. Abraham, your father and Sarah, who bore you. When you were, when they were one person, how I yep. greatly multiplied and blessed them. The Bible yep. says that a, a little one Come in on. the kingdom of God will be like a small nation and one person yep. will become like a thousand. God wants to multiply your efforts so that even a thousand people couldn't even produce what you're producing by the anointing so that when God gives you that Come platform, on. you can get, you know, they have all kinds of conferences, conferences for hotel business, conferences for everything. You can get up and then when they ask you, what's the secret of your success? You can say the Lord God Almighty. Yep. You can say it was God. You can say it's prayer. You could say, yep. had it not been for, for, for Jesus taking hold of my life and be a witness in those areas. So, Hey, TJ, we, we have the mayor of our city goes to our church. Mar Marketplace ministers, the mayor of our city, a uh, wonderful guy. He goes to our church. He's there on our, uh, you know every Sunday. We have doctor. We have nurses. We have police officers. We have uh, business owners that have started their own business and uh, prospered tremendously in our city. So when this COVID-19 hit, Probably 95% of our church was still working, uh, and they are they are a blessing. They and they are all marketplace ministers. They are all strong in prayer. Uh, they're faithful to service. They're faithful in their giving, and they're faithful in their witnessing on a regular basis. And it's uh, tremendous because they bring in people. I, I, I'm thinking of a, a couple of different uh, families in our church that that are so that are marketplace uh, business people owners bringing people into the kingdom on a regular basis. So we're thankful for that. We're seeing it on a regular basis here. That's amazing. Well, I, uh, thank you so much for coming on. I, before we finish and we close up, uh, like I said before, if you're having issues on Facebook, I have no idea why there's issues on Facebook, but if you are having issues, you can go onto our website, our YouTube uh, page afterwards and watch it from the beginning. I would not miss it. I certainly would not miss it. It's been a powerful time and, uh, we're going to finish up. Uh, pastor Francis is going to pray that, uh, you know, you just pray for the people, uh, yep. you know, we already prayed for healing miracles and stuff, but yep. pretty much for direction. If, if God's calling sure. them. If God's calling them, uh, that God would open, well, God's calling every one of you, but God yep. would open up your eyes 
to pretty much what you know the, the bible says a man's heart plans his way but the lord directs yes. his steps and yes. uh, it's very hard to see to see where you're walking if you have no light so god can shine the light to know to give you uh, 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 the ability to see where to walk yep. where to go you know the, the bible says the lord's counsel it will stand so yep. the only place you'll be standing and found standing that at the end of your life, like Paul, you're going to say, I've kept the faith. I, I'm still standing is yes. in the Lord's counsel. It's in the Lord's yes. will. It's in the Lord's plan. So Pastor Francis is going to pray for that uh, right now. However, before I do that, I had one more thing I wanted to say. Uh, I forgot it. So Pastor Francis, well, yeah, you go ahead and Thank pray. You, and, uh, yeah, lead us Father, up. we thank you again for every listener on this broadcast that's going to listen to it now or tomorrow or the next day. Father, I thank you that, first of all, praise always makes a way when there seems to be no way. And Father, I pray that those that are watching would be faithful in just seeking you, praising you, worshiping you. Father, you're the way maker. It's out of that relational, uh, God, re relationship that we have with you. Father, that all of a sudden doors begin to open. You begin to make ways. Father, I thank you that you've called us. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And Father, the hallmark of my life that has led me through and open doors for me has been that time of praise and worship and reading of your word. Father, I thank you for the anointing that lifts burdens and destroys yokes. Father, every Father, I break every lie spoken over people that would say that they cannot do it. And Father, I thank you for the marketplace ministers that are watching. Father, I thank you for the anointing uh, that, that is on their lives, God. Father, I pray that it would increase to multiple businesses even. And Father, those that are called into a, a more pastoral or involved in their church. Father, I pray that they would do it with the same anointing as a Reinhard Bonnke would do it when he does crusades. And Father, we pray for exponential growth in the days to come. Father, in uh, in our nation, in Canada, we pray for that revival that you promised us, that we know is coming. Touch each person watching right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank Amen. you so much, Pastor Francis. It's such an honor oh, to have you on the show. You're our very you. first guest. so <laughs> Thank you. I yeah. feel honored. Yeah, I, I was walking in. I remember I was in Costco talking to you on the phone, and then all of a sudden I felt the Spirit say, have him as your first guest. Let him be your – that's your first guest. That's the first one I want well, on. Thank you. So I believe this was awesome. uh, divinely appointed. And it was definitely a very powerful broadcast. And like I said, if you're just tuning in now and Facebook's making bugs and stuff, please go rewatch this broadcast on YouTube. Uh, hopefully Facebook, once we load it up afterwards, it won't have any you know, skipping or anything. But we watch it without interruption because it, it it's a great broadcast. I might just download it from YouTube and repost it on Facebook or whatever. Uh, I'm going to keep it for the archives for sure because it, it was a very powerful broadcast. And I'm believing God. That uh, many of you were healed. I'm believing God for breakthrough. I'm believing yeah. God for direction. I'm believing God um, for whatever you know. So we prayers for my family to come and serve you and know your purpose. You know, yeah. Father, we in the name of Jesus, I pray for Shireen's family mm -hmm. that they yeah. would come to the full knowledge of you, that their eyes would be yes. open to see the hope yes. of your calling. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Uh, thank you, Pastor Francis. We're thank definitely going to have you back on in the near future. Uh, until then. Uh, I'm going to close up with my with, uh, with the people that are still on. But uh, yep. I just want to thank, thank you, you for, for coming on. I love you too. Thank you. Bless you. Yep. We'll be in touch. Bye-bye. Well, thanks for joining us today. I'm uh, sorry that we had a little bit of, a, of issues with uh, what was going on with uh, the broadcast on Facebook. But... Everything's resolved now. Thank the Lord. If you go on YouTube, you can just uh, rewatch it from the beginning. I see still we have Jim on. We have Isha. We have uh, Christine still on. Mark Holly, Sharon. A lot of people on YouTube today. Uh, I would love to open up a door for you. If you'd like to give today, you can do so by going on to salvationnow.ca uh, slash give. So if you go on salvationnow.ca slash give, I'll put the link up right here you could uh you can stand with us in the ministry give to it you know i want to thank everybody that's joined on on month as a monthly partner recently in times uh in the last two three months you know when people should have <laughs> it's like logically naturally people should be saving we don't know it's uncertain times but people have been giving more people have been uh upping their monthly partnership people have been signing up as monthly partners so i want to thank everybody that's been doing that i really appreciate you and uh, understand that the word of God says when you give, 
You're not giving to men. You're not giving to me. You're not giving to help me out. You're not giving uh, to, to an, a charity. You're not giving to get a charitable receipt or anything. The Bible says when you give, here on earth, mortal men receive tithes and offerings, but there in heaven, God receives them. God is receiving your gift today. And the, the good thing is, is that God's hands are not subtracting hands. God's hands are not even addition hands. God's hands are multiplication hands. The Bible says in John 6, when that little boy took his five loaves, and two and uh, two fish and put them in the hands of Jesus they didn't stay the same they, it's not like Jesus just ate a lot of people think when God moves on you and speaks to you to give something that it's God trying to eat your seed God trying to take away from you God never takes away from anybody God adds to people God is an increaser God increases people God multiplies people the Bible says when he called Abraham he said when he told them to sacrifice Isaac, it wasn't so that he can kill Isaac and then be gone with Isaac. It was so that as he showed that I'm, there's nothing I'm holding back. Abraham said, there's nothing I'm holding back from you, O oh God. And as he did that, what did, they, what did God do? He stopped him as he was about to strike his son. And he said, now I know that you don't withhold anything from me. And by myself, I have sworn that in blessing, I will bless you. And in multiplying, I will multiply you. As he was ready to sacrifice the Isaac level seed, the thing that meant the most to his heart, God was then standing in the back. If he does it, I'll, I'll, I'll put a sworn blessing on him. And he did. Abraham carried a sworn blessing. That from Genesis 12 to Gen, uh, Genesis 13, he went from Abraham, just a guy leaving his father's house. not with He didn't have anything. He wasn't great. He wasn't wealthy. And then Genesis 13 too, the Bible says, Abraham was very wealthy in livestock silver and gold Solomon Solomon sacrificed a thousand burnt offerings to the Lord and when the Lord appeared to him and said what you want me to do for you so obviously his giving got God's attraction uh, attention and when God came and said what do you want me to do for you he said Lord I just need wisdom what did God say well then wisdom is the only thing I'm gonna no he said even above the wisdom I'm going to give you, because you've done, you've asked for something that's pleasing in my sight, I'm not just going to give you wisdom. I'm going to give you a wealth such as nobody's ever known, and I'm going to give you the heads of your enemies. I'm going to give you total victory and total rest everywhere you go. And when the queen of Sheba came to visit Solomon's palace, the Bible says she fainted. Her spirit left her and said the half of it has not even been told. We, I heard that you were wealthy. I heard that, you know, everything you were doing was great. But now that I've seen it, man, the half of it hasn't even been told. God has that place for you. God has that blessing. The blessing of the Lord is for them that fear him and he adds no sorrow to it and it makes it makes a man rich God has that for you you know wealth in your heart is very bad but when God puts more into your hands you can be a blessing Abraham I blessed you to be a blessing to your generation and God wants to make you a blessing to overflow if you don't have overflow if you're just you know a lot of Christians they want thank God I have just enough just enough doesn't help your neighbor just enough doesn't help uh people that are in need just enough doesn't help the whole the homeless because if you have just enough so that your kids can survive and you can survive you you know thank God for for God meeting your needs but the Bible doesn't say I'm El Chipo it says I'm El Shaddai the God of more than enough God has more than enough to help you to help and to be a help through you on the earth so I want to thank you in advance for everyone giving like I said salvationnow.ca slash give uh, Johan thanks for sticking around Shireen thanks for sticking around er Ernestine Holness thanks for sticking around Frankie man you've been on the whole broadcast thanks for st sticking around yes watch the replay and um, we'll be on Tuesday this coming Tuesday I have a guest evangelist, a mentor in the faith to me, Tiff, Evan uh, Tiff Shuttlesworth, not Tiff Evangelist, Tiff Shuttlesworth, evangelist Tiff Shuttlesworth will be on with me, and he's a powerful man of God, uh, and, and uh, you know, it's just, we've just had, st starting off with Pastor Francis, going into, we're having great guests on, you know, we'll never have anybody on that's like, you know, lukewarm or doesn't carry any fire. The people that we have on have the fire of God. And I want to get that into you. And I want it to be a blessing to you just as they have been blessing, a blessing to me. Um, all right, that's it. We'll be on Tuesday and perhaps maybe this weekend if I decide to make, you know, it's my show, my schedule. I get to do whatever I want, whenever I want. But thanks for joining. Laura, pray for strength to keep following Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for Laura. I pray that um, wherever she's grown weary, that there be fresh oil, that the stale oil, Lord, you said that 
a smoldering wick you will not snuff out. I pray in the name of Jesus that you would dip her in the kerosene of your spirit and set her ablaze for you, that she'd never burn out. In Jesus' name, for you're still the God who increases power to him that lacks might. And you're still the God who upholds us by your right hand. Your, your word says, when I thought my foot would slip, you, O Lord, upheld me. Father, I pray, keep her feet from slipping in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Also, I feel to do this. If you're here today, you've stuck on, you've never given your life to Jesus Christ. I want to invite you to pray this prayer with me. It would be wrong to close a broadcast like this without giving an invitation, a clear invitation. Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, came. We were all born in sin. We were all born uh, in the poison of sin. We all needed a Redeemer. And there was no way for us ourselves to redeem ourselves. There's no amount of money you can throw at God. There's no amount of charity. There's no good works that will please God or uh, shock God or get Him to say, man, well done, good and faithful servant. There's nothing you can do in the flesh to get Him to even blink an eye. The Bible says we have all fallen short of the glory of God we've all turned aside we've together become corrupt how be it the Bible says God sent his son and demonstrated his love towards us while we were yet sinners Christ died for us Christ died for you doesn't matter how far you've gone doesn't matter what you've done doesn't matter how dirty you feel how wicked you feel it doesn't even matter how good you feel you need Jesus Christ you need the Bible says no man cometh to the father no man gains access Jesus is the passport for entrance into heaven and Jesus is the passport uh, for ambassadorialship here on the earth. You can have right relationship with Jesus and with God by doing three simple things. Number one, A, admit that you're a sinner. Admit that you need God's help. B, you need to believe on the gospel. And then C, you need to confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So I want to invite you to pray that prayer with me right now. Say this from the bottom of your heart. Say, Father, in Jesus' name, I believe with my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. I believe that you raised, you were raised in, uh, you were raised as victorious. I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord of my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Wash me clean. Let old things be passed away and everything become new. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, I want you to go on our website, salvationnow.ca. First link that pops up is I just got saved. Click it, fill it out. I want to get a, a material to you free of charge, my blessing from me to you. And I want to get that in your hands so that we can help you and assist you in this life. I'd love to plug you into a church, a good church, find a good Bible-believing church, good Holy Ghost church, wherever you're at. Uh, Vanessa, Valerie Peterson, love you all. Thank you so much for watching. We'll be on next week. If you don't follow us on um, Instagram, it's at TJ Malkanji. Also, if you didn't catch it, I was just on a good friend of mine, Isaiah Salivar's broadcast. Uh, and so I have that linked up on my Facebook page. And uh, also, if you go on his page, like Isaiah Salivar, you can check it up. And he also is a great man of God. I'd encourage you to follow him. Get plugged into what he's doing. He's, he's a, a phenomenal voice on the earth today. A, revival, a true revivalist. And um, we had a great time Tuesday. We went like two hours and a half. Just like amazing uh, answering questions that people asked, a Q&A on the supernatural lifestyle of a believer because the supernatural is for everybody. It's not just for the pastor, the evangelist, the prophet. It's not just for the fivefold. Stephen was a deacon and was operating the supernatural and God wants to, he that believes, they will cast out devils. God wants to have you operate that same way. So if you haven't got a chance to check it out, you can go and do that. It's on my Facebook page. If you haven't subscribed to our YouTube, it's TJ Malkanji on YouTube, on um on Facebook, you can like, follow our page. On Instagram, TJ Malkanji. We're even on Twitter, TJ Malkanji. And uh, I look forward to seeing you all on those platforms. Until next time, I love you. May goodness and mercy follow you all the days of your life. God bless you.